Noch einmal englische Beke. 889. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. 889. Das sind so Leute, wie wir noch was auf eng singen, und wir fühlen bis noch einmal aufhängen, so wir noch zweimal gleich singen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the holiness, wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange in the light of his glory and grace.
Right, children, all of you were looking forward to this English message this morning, so turn your Bibles to Hosea, chapter 10, verse 12. Sometimes our children ask, is it the English message today or not? That will determine whether they bring their Bibles with or not. <laughs> so anyway, that's why I did that. <clears throat> That'll be our text verse this morning. But before we read that, um, yeah, good to be back. Many of us are traveling, and uh, when I think about that, you know, there's some right now that are going to Mexico, and some of us have just returned, and there's a lot of traveling going on. Some went to Ontario, some are planning to go, and, and uh, the safety that God gives us as a family or as a church as we're traveling so much that uh, let, us, let us be reminded this morning to be thankful for that because that is, you know, that is something that is very, uh, we can be very grateful for that. And even if something happens, um, let's never forget that God is still in control. You know, Jonathan Friesen is usually here this, on a Sunday morning. Today he's not here. So 
his friends that are usually playing with him in the gym or outside, well, today they're not going to be playing with Jonathan, but we hope that he'll be here next Sunday, right? Right now they're in Calgary in the children's hospital there, and uh, so there's some, because I, I haven't heard the details of what exactly happened, but I'm picturing that a toolbox fell on him and, and he landed on the floor, on a cement floor, and so his, his head got quite a a bump or a smash, and that has caused some, some head injuries, we could say. And so that is, uh, they're praying for, for healing. So that is a big thing. If I think about that, you know, um, Carter usually plays with Jonathan. And so right now, some of Jonathan's face, it's not, it's not acting quite normal yet. There's some nerves that are damaged or are probably swollen, whatever it may be. So let's continue to pray for that 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 young boy can fully recover and heal. <clears throat> Good. Um, maybe I'll do this first. A while ago, I read in Romans, and uh, maybe two months ago, and I was just uh, Romans chapter 1. Many times when I read, uh, you know, the beginning of any book or epistle in the Bible, I'm always kind of... Uh, a lot of them, I guess, Paul wrote a lot of the epistles that we have in the New Testament. How many is it again? Some of the children. How many epistles did Paul write? Who's got the number? Come on now, quickly. I'm looking for a number that's a little bit higher, I think. 13? Who gives me the 13? I'm going to say it's 13. That's what I... What I, what my, but you might be right, but I'm thinking it's 13. But anyway, that's quite, quite a few. There's, there's 26 letters, 26 epistles in the New Testament, and Paul wrote, we could say, half of them, half of the epistles. So here in Romans 1, I'm just uh, going to read that as a greeting. And uh, here he's got about eight verses that he does as an introduction to the Roman area or the Roman people, the Romans. <clears throat> So verse 1, he says, I'm not going to read all the eight verses, but let's just take note here in verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So I'm just, uh, again, we see that Paul just has it very clear that he says, first of all, he says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm called to be an apostle. An apostle is someone that has seen Jesus physically. So there's churches today that have, uh, that have that name in their apostle or, or there's a church as well. They, they would, they'll, they'll say that we are the apostles and I think that's, that's biting off a big chunk. I feel that that is uh, something that we should not do. But Paul says, I'm an apostle. Jesus chose himself 12 disciples. Those 12 disciples, we would also call them apostles. They were called to proclaim the, the news, the gospel. They were also witnesses. They had seen these things. And Paul was, he, he, uh, he also saw Jesus physically. So here it says, I'm an apostle. And then he says, he is separated unto the gospel. Um, in high German, we have that word, Osgesondert zu predigen das Evangelium Gottes. So Paul was very clear that, that he was not here just because. There in that verse, it's packed full of this is what he felt God's call was in his life. Good. So this message, the, the title that I uh, have for this morning is As It Was in the Days of Noah. As It Was in the Days of Noah. <clears throat> so Hosea chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 12, that is our text verse, which reads, it says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. This is a verse that I don't think we will be able to fully explain today, but it's a very precious verse, very powerful verse. It talks about sow to yourselves in righteousness. So sowing. So we've been gone two weeks, almost two weeks that we were away from home. 
And one of the things I saw as we were driving and really noticed when we were coming back, that is things were a little bit different as we were coming from Tabor to, to our house just in the last two weeks. And the thing that I saw was where they do the twinning of the highway, they have the, uh, um, the piles of dirt they've piled up on the side there. And we see that they're no longer nice and brown. You know, when they started working with the dirt and moved the soil and so forth, they piled it up. And, and, uh, but now you see, especially on the piles, you just see a pile of weeds. It's grown with weeds. And that wasn't like that two weeks ago or for sure not a month ago. You know, when they just moved that dirt, there wasn't those weeds that we see on the piles right now. For those of you that will be traveling back to Tabor today or, or going west, look at the piles. They're just fully grown and fully covered with weeds. And that's in, uh, in a short time that that happens. And it made me think, you know, uh, when I think about uh, Christianity and you travel and you talk with people, different churches, you hear of uh, different people, what they're experiencing and going through, I had to think of, of that in light of our spiritual growth. That, that many times that's what will happen to, uh, to our life as well. You know, if we would just have all the farmers around here, if they would just, you know, work their, their ground in the springtime and they would just um, have a nice, um, you know, cultivator behind there, and they would just till all the ground and cultivate it, and they wouldn't sow anything. They wouldn't put anything in the, in, in the field. All of us, we, would just, we, would, we wouldn't like to look at the fields. They would just be full of weeds. But the farmer knows that he's got to put something, even in the corners, they like to put something there, Sometimes they say it, you know, if, if, if we don't get anything else, at least we'll keep the weeds away. And so you, you, you plant something, you, you, uh, you seed something so that the weeds won't grow up. And I want to use some of those analogies in, in light of our spiritual life as well, you know. If I think of the past two weeks and just the, the, uh, the amount of weeds that have grown in the, pa in the last while... That is what happens in our life as well. When it says, our text verse says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. So we see the word sowing there and it, and it encourages us to do it with righteousness, in righteousness. So if we don't do anything, weeds will grow spiritually. Unhealthy things, unhealthy habits will grow. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage us that, that just by leaving things, then, uh, then that will happen. There will be things happening in our life, and someone will come by later on and will say, you know, that person, that family, or that church, something has changed there. And may it be that they will see um, fruit, not seeds, I mean, not weeds, but that they will see the... Uh, the seeds of righteousness being sown and that, that we can have, you know, it says here, reap in mercy. Another thing that I uh, just have just noticed, we, uh, we dug some trenches last year and in our yard. And today, if you come there, you will very likely, you'll be able to see, okay, exactly here, they trenched something. We worked the ground a little bit deeper, right? Some, some soil came up. And uh, so wherever you do some trenching, you can usually see that weeds will, will be uh, sprouting there. And I'm not sure what all that, why, why that all happens or what all, you know, is involved in that. But you see that wherever you trench something in a field and we see it on our grass, that that is, you know, you can exactly see the row where things are, have been trenched the last year. And again, a lot of times what I see there is there is the potential that weeds will actually grow there. You have to work so that the, that the, um, that the grass will start growing there and, and spray for the weeds that are there. <clears throat> so when you don't sow anything, weeds will come up. 
And we know weeds are not healthy. Weeds is not something that we want. And in our spiritual life, that is not uh, something that we, we want to have there. We see the weeds, if they are in a plant or if they're in a, on a field, they will also suck some of the nutrition and the fertilizer out of the soil. So weeds suck the life out of the beautiful plants. Sin wants to, or let me say sin will drain your spiritual inner man. And so if we want to prevent that, and if we want, um, like our, our text verse says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, if we want that, then we have to do something. We have to intentionally make effort and, uh, and seek to see things that we want to harvest later on. Galatians 5 or 16, a very familiar verse, but that verse says, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walking in the spirit. There again we are encouraged to do something. We walk in the spirit. What does that mean when we walk in the spirit? That is not just um, wandering about. Not having intentions or um, a drive for something. But we are walking in the spirit. We are communicating with our heavenly father. Through reading the word, meditating, praying, these things we intentionally do. And we, we, we make effort to do them so that we can be filled. God's word clearly says the washing of his word, it does something in our life. The washing of his word just simply means we read it. We let it, um, you know, if we don't read God's word... Well, it's not washing us. It's not doing something. But if we, if we read God's word and allow it to, to do something in our life, allow it to renew our mind, allow us to be, be refreshed by the verse that we might almost know by memory, it does something to us. <clears throat> so in, in Luke 17, verse 26, that's where Jesus says the, uh, these things to, uh, to the people there, the, uh, as it was in the days of Noah. So I'll just read a... Uh, a few verses there in Luke 17. So this chapter is a warning. And uh, in verse 26, here Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. I'll read right up to there. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just... Uh, just like I said, when you travel and you come back and you see the change that that is happening or, you know, just with the, the weeds that I saw there. I also saw it in Mexico. When, I, uh, when you go on to some farmland there, you see that. They have to continually spray. They have to continually have people on the field to, to make an effort to root out the seeds, uh, the, the weeds that are there. And that's just an ongoing thing. And in our life, in our spiritual life, let's not forget that that is what we will have to do as well. It will be an ongoing thing to, uh, to continue guarding for the things that are destructive to our spiritual man. So when Jesus has, says here, as it was in the days of Noah, well, then we have to go back and, and we could, in short, we could read Genesis chapter 4, 5, and 6, and there we would read how it was in the days of Noah. 
We know that God looked upon this earth. He looked upon mankind. And he says, you know, I will destroy. I will destroy the earth. Why? Because of, if we want to call it, because it was overgrown with weeds. I remember when we were living in Mexico, we had a, a small patch of onions there, about eight acres, nine acres of onions. And I had sprayed so that the weeds wouldn't come up. And, and, but anyway, it got out of hand, and there was just so many weeds there. When you looked on it, you saw more weeds than onion plants. And I was discouraged. Really, actually, I had thoughts of just let it be. And then one of the brothers, you know, that had lived there longer, he says, oh, no, hey, just hire some people, and they'll have it done in two or three days. They'll have all the weeds out of there. And I'm kind of like, that's not going to happen. But anyway, I, I hired people, and, and they gladly wanted to earn money, and so they, they started pulling weeds out. You know, they didn't have a hose, so they walked along the rows on their knees and actually pulled weeds out. And it literally just took a few days and it was done. But you know, the, the discouraged feeling of just seeing uh, something that you have planted and now it's all grown over with weeds. And uh, I don't know how God saw things, but he, he was, you know, he looked upon mankind and it says that he said, I will destroy mankind. I want to start again. Because of the sin that was upon the earth. And I would just want to, uh, in light of that, we just want to take a few things. We want to look in Genesis chapter 4 and we want to just note a few things that were there as it was in the days of Noah. So point number one, we would say it was an age of godlessness. Godlessness. They didn't care about God. Genesis 4, verse 16, says like this. You can read it. Genesis 4, verse 16, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. What does that mean? Maybe we should read the whole verse, but here we know Cain, he killed his brother. God gave him a punishment. But here it says, Maybe we should read verse 15 to get a little bit of a better picture. It says, And the Lord said unto him, that means Cain, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So just that short part here and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord wonder what that means like we read in Psalms it says the, the psalmist says if I if I ascend to the hill thou art there if I make my dwelling in the lower parts of the earth thou art there and he just names up more things he says you can't flee God here it says and Cain went from the presence of the Lord Where did he go? What does that mean? As I meditated upon that, I think what I gather from that is he simply did not want God in his doings. He leaned away from God, not towards him. So it was a, a godless people. I looked up that word godless, and here's a few definitions that that came from that. So when we think about godlessness, that means not acknowledging a deity or a divine law. Not acknowledging a deity, that means a god. A god, uh, the trinity, uh, uh, we could say. Another one said, a mode of thinking or being that excludes God from life and ignores or perhaps even deliberately violates God's law and commandments. So a mode of thinking. Um, kind of our, our thought pattern. That God, I don't need you. 
And we would all say that that's not where we want to be. That is not a place where I want to be, where I exclude God and, and I even get a mindset that, you know what, really, I can go on without God. But we see that it says here that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and I think it means that, you know, the punishment that God gave him and, and he felt like a failure, and, and uh, clearly this was a sin that he had done in, in killing his brother. He just wanted to get out, get away from God, get away from his presence. And uh, <clears throat> so when we think about uh, as it was in the, in the days of Noah, we can say um, this was one of the things that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, not towards God. And so that's, that's what we see in general today as well. And we have to ask ourselves, how is my life? Am I turning towards God? And the decisions that I make, the life that I live, is there, is God involved in my life, in my personal life, in my family life, or in my work world? Do I have God in that? We see a lot today that people have sold out to amusement. There's, there, they've sold out to sports activities, or we could say work. A lot of people, and I think when we think about work, we would have to include ourselves in this, that we have to work because we've done this, we need to make the payments for this, and, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of money that needs to be earned to supply what life has to offer or what we have all, um, you know, what we've all bought to make payments for that. So have we sold out to some of these? Would we have to say, uh, you know, just asking ourselves, would I have to say, you know, I've been, I've been uh, focusing too much on the entertainment or the amusement? Have I put too much of my time into sports? Have I put too much time into work? Just asking yourselves, if I were to do math and I would divide my week, and I would write it down, okay, this many hours I spent at work and this many hours I spent playing some sort of a sports. This many hours I, I was on entertainment, whether it is watching something or whether it's on some social media platform, um, whether it is whatever it may be. But, you know, you would just divide them into these three categories. And let's put number four there, and that is uh, in... Yeah, reading God's word or being involved in some spiritual activity. If we would divide them into those th four categories, how would our math chart or how would our graph look? How would the pie be? Would it be divided evenly? Would there be one big chunk of one category? So we see that in the days of Noah, there was a godless people. <clears throat> we also see that when we think of godlessness, that in our time today, there is a lot of people that seem to put their confidence, not in God, but in signs and in the achievements rather than in the power of God. Signs has advanced so much. And there is so much to see through a telescope. There is so much that, they, they're, that they're always studying. And if we leave God out, if we leave Scripture out, we will come to that point where we'll just be amazed at what the human brain and what the computer and all these things can do. I read in uh, an article where it says, many tend to put confidence in signs and in the achievement of man rather than in the power of God. Instead of looking into the heavens and saying with the psalmist, when I consider thy heavens, the works of thy uh, fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Many are looking into the heavens and saying, when I consider the satellites, the space vehicles which men have made, 
Who is God that I should pay any attention to him? And I know we probably don't word it exactly like that, but there's in our world we have many people that are just they're, they are just occupied with trying to find out more scientific things and sending out more space uh, satellites, um, different things that are, that are orbiting the earth and they want to study and so forth. And they forget, like the psalmist says, when I consider thy heavens. This is Psalms 8, verse 3 and 4. I like the way the psalmist puts it. He says, when I consider thy heavens. The work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou has made, which thou has ordained. And then he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? So clearly he just acknowledges God and who God is. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 17 and 18. I'll read a few verses there. Proverbs 11, verse 17 and 18 says, um, <clears throat> The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. So again, I think I was thinking of of sowing righteousness. <clears throat> so an age of godlessness, whether it is by uh, the entertainment we have or whether it's the things that are being made today, but let's be reminded this morning that God is the one that is in control and the uh, wisdom that he has given to mankind to, to make a lot of things I, uh, I think we want to acknowledge that, that God has given uh, man an incredible mind. But let's look at the heavens. Let's look at the, at the things and remember that God has, has given us a lot of resources to do things with. If we didn't have the resources that God has given us, then we would be um, short-lived. The second thing that we want to note this morning when we think of as it was in the days of Noah, it was an age of, of building, an age of the city building. Genesis 4, verse 17. It says here of Cain again, it says, And Cain built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So first we had in Genesis uh, 4 verse 16, where, where Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. Here we have, it says Cain uh, built a city. Interesting that um, at this point, I guess we don't know how long the earth has, has been, but he built a city. And cities are good, they're not bad. But uh, we see that uh, a city... The bigger cities, there's lots of things happening there, there that are not healthy. So, um, in a crowded area, in a place, in a city, in a big city, it seems like there's a lot of crime that happens there. Um, there's a lot of things that are unhealthy, we could say. And it's not that it's just a big city, that, that it happens in big cities. You know, it's sinful man that is living there. But uh, there is something to be, you know, when you look at a city, I enjoy driving through a big city, at least if, if there's not the, uh, um, too many vehicles on the road or rush hour and so forth. But driving through a city, I usually enjoy it. But I, uh, you know, I, get, I soon get tired of driving through Calgary, especially if you come, uh, come there at a time where there's a lot of traffic and there's, it just, you know, you feel like I wouldn't want to live in this crowded area. I wouldn't want to live among so many people. When we were having VBS here, I uh, had a devotional for the children, and one of the uh, verses that I read there was 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, which says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. So evil communications corrupt good manners. And when there's a lot of people together, and there's, there's uh, looseness of uh, speech or... 
You know, if there's not a direction, if there's not a goal, then just like we see out on the, uh, the fields or out on the side of the ditches right now, nothing is being seeded there and weeds grow. That's the same thing that happens in a big city. There's a lot of sinful people together in one place. And if the sinful people have, don't have the new birth and aren't focused on God, weeds will grow. Sin will take root. And so again, I just want to say, I'm not saying that the big cities are the thing that we want to avoid, but I'm, you know, when I think about scripture in, uh, of Lot, it says, when he went away from Abraham, it says, and he turned his face toward the city. I always read between the lines there, that means he liked what was happening in the city life. And so, when, when you hear of someone that says, you know, I'm going to move to the city. I'm going to move to uh, this and this city. Well, it all depends on why they move there. But uh, I think all of us have probably have grown up. We've heard some of the things, you know, of we need to be careful at, at these places. As we were traveling, one night we stayed in Salt Lake City. And in Salt Lake City there, so the, the motel that we rented there, right beside there, there was a, a, the University of Salt Lake City. And there was just so many students there. They must have summer school or something, but there was so many students there. And this was at 10 o'clock in the evening, and we walked outside, and there was, I would say, hundreds of university students. And uh, they were, some were playing tennis, some were playing something else, volleyball, and there were just a lot of students there. I didn't see anything that wasn't healthy, so to say. I didn't look that closely, but just what I observed there. But I just thought about it, you know. Again, here we have a lot of young people, a lot of energy. And, uh, and I think, when I think of a big city, I also think of the universities and of the colleges that are there. Again, they're not wrong, but I think we have to, we have to remember that Let's go to a city, let's go to a place where there's this uh, gathering of people. We, ha we must have a purpose and, and a goal that will be uh, pleasing to God. If not, if we just say, you know, I'm going to move to the city. Oh, I'm not going to do some of the things that they do there and that are offered there. Well, I'm sure two, three weeks ago we would say, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't picture all the weeds that are grown on these soil piles that are uh, beside the highway but that that does happen <clears throat> so it was an age of where they started building a city and we see uh, later on that it caused Lot and his family it caused the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> the last one that I want to look at as we looked how it was in the days of Noah so when when Jesus says that's how it will be at the end time we also see that it was a breakdown of the family. Genesis 4, verse 19. Just a short part of that verse. But Genesis 4, verse 19, it says, And Lamech took unto him two wives. How many wives did God bring to Adam there? Well, we read very clearly that he, bought, he brought one wife to Adam. Here it says, Genesis 4, we're not very far, says, and Lamech took unto him two wives, so the breakdown of the home. When Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, one of the things that we see that is happening, that happened there, that was exactly this, it was a breakdown of the home. In the New Testament, exactly in, in uh, Luke there, Jesus said that in the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. So I think that implies that there was unfaithfulness um, in, in the people or uh, that, they were, that, that they were not having one wife and one man. And we see this so much today in the world. And... Uh, so that was a warning. So the break, breakdown of a home, not only the breakdown of a marriage, but a lot of times it happens. And uh, that's where it starts happening, right? It's, it's in, the, in the marriage. 
When you have a strong Christian brother and a strong godly sister, they get married, and if they continue to be strong in Christ, that will help for a strong family. But the breakdown of the home is something that happens when there is an unhealthy marriage, we could say. Things that are not being brought to the cross. And I'll just finish with this story. Maybe some of you have read that. An, uh, an article in the, uh, the book, The Remnant. But it was an article of two men, two brothers that were going to a Bible study. Um, they were having a small Bible study in an older fellow's house or in his shop. This older fellow, his name was Ken. And, and so the story kind of starts off with that, that there was, uh, was it screaming going on? Or they, they had just left, I think, they had just left this Bible study. And this, this man, Ken, he had been angry and, and had just yelled at these two brothers. And so now they're walking down the street, again asking themselves, man, what can we do? For six years, they had been coming and having a Bible study with Ken already. Now let me go back to Ken as a seven-year-old boy, or even earlier. Ken grew up, and let's, I'm going to paint this picture, and this will be the closing. So Ken grew up as a little boy. He, the, the recollection that he has is he heard his mom and dad yelling and screaming and being mad at each other. And he had heard that quite often. And one day, the point came where his mom packed the suitcases and packed his clothes and took the children, him and his siblings, took them into a car and sped away from home and uh, <clears throat> was mad. His mom was mad. They had just gotten into an argument again, the husband and the wife. And so the mom went to a city and rented a small apartment. And so that's where she was with her children. This was different than what Ken had been previously. Previously, he had been at home sleeping there. And, and he had ran on the hills. And he had been out in the country and on the farm. But now he was in a city. And... Uh, Soon his mom, she couldn't earn enough money to pay for the things that needed to be. And so Ken was placed in a foster home. And uh, that kind of scared him to go into a different place, but that's what was happening now. So he had to go into a different home. And uh, that wasn't a healthy home either. Sometimes he got yelled at as a young boy from the people. And it only took less than a year and he was given to another home. And he, he just shares the story. He says, that night when I, when I was at the supper table, then he accidentally spilled the cup of water. So his first evening at that supper table, he spills a cup of water. And, and the mom of that home, she yelled at him and was just terribly angry that he had spilled that cup. And the man, the husband, was just sitting quietly at the end there. Soon it was time to go to bed, and he says, I went to bed and felt very strange. It was a nice, clean, big bed, and there I was all alone in this room. The only thing that looked familiar to me was my clothes lying on the ground. Other than that, it was all strange. And pretty soon he heard that mom yelling from downstairs and coming up the stairs, and Ken was already thinking, man, what did I do? What's she going to, like, what did I do? And he jumps out of bed and he runs behind the door, hiding behind the door and hoping that she will not find him. But to his luck, she walks past his room and actually goes into another room. She was mad at a different child. But this is how he was growing up. And then the next picture that he paints, he was, he was 13 years old. Forget already what all happened when he was 13 years old, but again, he was at a different home and things were not going good. And pretty soon he had a friend in school and that family was actually going to go to California. And he thought, you know, if I could only go with to California with that family. And uh, so in his thinking as a young 13 to 15 year old, uh, 13, 14, 15 years old, 
he, uh, he thought, you know, I'm going to ask if I can go with that family. Not ask his parents where he was at right now, not the foster parents, but just ask the family who was going. And he says, they took me. They took me with to California. So as a 15-year-old boy, he went to California, and he made his living, he says, on the beach there, trying to help the fishermen, whatever they needed help with, and they, he would get a little bit of money. And uh, with that money, he made his living. He doesn't say a lot of where he spent his nights or what he did there, but that he made his living. He says, soon I got into a wrong crowd and, and started doing things that were not good. Soon I got a girlfriend, and uh, we liked each other. And, and one thing Ken always thought about, you know, I don't want to raise a home like I was grown up. I don't want to be, be married and that we will argue as my parents did. And uh, I don't want my children to have the life that I grew up in. And he says, so he had this girlfriend. Soon they were expecting a little baby before they were married, and they did get married. And just fast forwarding, there's more details to that story, but he says it was less than eight years, and they were divorced. So from marriage... In those eight years, there's, there was a lot of arguments going on there. There was a lot of things that were unhealthy. And in less than eight years, he was alone again. His wife was somewhere else. The children that they had up to that point, they were somewhere else. <clears throat> and this was the man that these two brothers were having Bible study with. They knew Ken's story. And so here they were walking down the street and they were, they were thinking, what can we do that we can tell Ken that he will believe that God loves him, that God cares for him? And Ken says, how can God love me? And he tells him, he recalls his childhood and where he is at right now. You know, now he's an old man. And he recalls all the hurts and the pains and the, the weeds that are in his life, the sin that is in his life. I don't know the ending to that story, but I do like the part that these brothers have been there for six years already, not giving up. Needing to show someone that God doesn't give up on us. As long as we have breath, God pursues us. We heard it in the Sunday school. Klaus mentioned that, you know, God is always there and he always wants to help even though we have failed. Again, going back to our text verse says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. We have not really focused upon break up the fallow ground, you know, that just simply means that work, look into our heart and work, examine yourself, the scripture says, break up your fallow ground. And then it says, for it is time to seek the Lord. That's the time where we are today. It is time to seek the Lord. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, the people were not seeking the Lord in the days of Noah. Here we are encouraged it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. How long are we to seek the Lord? This verse says, until he will rain righteousness upon you. How does righteousness upon your life look? What do you think that means when, when the Bible says here, he will rain righteousness upon you? Let's not quit looking for the Lord until we are sure that he is raining righteousness upon us. The first verse, or the first part of the verse said, so to yourselves in righteousness. The last, ver uh, last part of that verse says, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. May that be that we would look at this verse and like I said, there's so much more that we can take of that, but I think we have looked into it 
briefly this morning. Let's stand up for prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we have looked into your word. We are grateful this morning that we can all have the opportunity, we all have a right, we all have a privilege to take your word, to take the Bible literally and read it. And Father, as we have read here, so to yourselves in righteousness. We know that if we will not do that, weeds will grow. Sin will be in our life. If we do not seek you, if we do not, do not lean towards you, then we will be like Cain who went away from the presence of the Lord. O oh God, have mercy on us that we would not walk away from the presence of the Lord. Each soul that is here today, you have fearfully and wonderfully created. Your longing, your outstretched arm is there for all of us. And you want us to turn towards you, not away from you. So Father, be merciful to us. Help us that we would not be godless, but God-fearing. May it be that we would seek to build our homes, that there would not be the breakdown of the home, but an effort made to build up the home. Father, there are many families that are represented here. You have instituted marriage. You have instituted the family. And I pray that we would that it would be dear to our heart, that it would be very precious to our heart, the family that you have given us. And so, Father, we just ask for your grace and for your mercy. We ask for your favor to be upon us. And like this verse says, that we would break up the fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord and that he would rain righteousness upon us. Help us not to give up in seeking, until we feel that refreshing rain coming from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. English books again, number 464. Take the name of Jesus with you. 464. No, so me, to me, so. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of home. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it, then we're here. 